I've been really excited about giving this uh, topic. I've had it on my brain for several months now, and I'm glad to uh, get out some of this information. I, I, I just want to praise everyone that showed up for this. Um, the top, the title uh, that includes uh, best practices for administering our student production is not a very sexy title. Um, so I'm really glad that people showed up for the talk. Uh, I do have a lot of uh, things to topics to go through. I'll try to go through quickly, uh, give you an overview of a number of different topics I think are important before jumping into the demos. So I work in solutions engineering um, and at solutions engineering, uh, that our team helps you integrate our studio products into your system. Um, so things that involve integration are things like authentication, security, servers, cloud architectures, databases, Spark, TensorFlow, Kubernetes, all these things that surround your R environment, these are the things that we get really excited about. We have a great team. You might have seen us around. Uh, the team members are Sean, Edgar, Cole, Andre, James, Kelly, Chris, and Alex. And uh, we hang out in a ver variety of places. Uh, the best place to find us is, is in community. And we hope that you'll go to community and interact with us there. We have a, a GitHub page and our own website. And then we frequently contribute to the support and docs websites. This webinar is really designed for the R admin. Uh, the, sometimes I call the R admin a data scientist who wants to do more. Um, they want to do things like pipelines and installation, scaling, and then building these platforms. Um, if that describes you, um, welcome here in the right place. Um, the R evangelists, people who are trying to get R Studio and R more uh, widely adopted in their organizations. IT ops, of course, We're always happy to have, have IT ops on board. And uh, anyone who wants to try R Studio professional products, if you don't know anything about professional products and this is your first time here, um, this is a great way to get introduced to professional products. We're going to walk actually walk through all of them. So our studio empowers individuals to be productive um, with uh, data science. Uh, we believe in things like, uh, well, we're strong believers in uh, open source and reproducible research. And uh, we believe in things like APIs and interoperability. Uh, we want to have our work be you know, really usable with clear documentation. We believe in uh, inclusivity and collective success. We really want all of the work that we do to have lasting value. So we take a long-term approach here at our studio. We build uh, open source and professional software for data science. Our open source software is used in almost every organization that uses R. When organizations benefit from open source software, we think they have an obligation to reinvest in the community that provided it. Organizations can contribute to our open source software in part by purchasing our professional products. But our business does not rely on altruism. Uh, our professional features include important things that uh, customers want, like security, authentication, load balancing, support, and many other things. And these are the products that we sell, uh, RStudio Server Pro, RStudio Connect, and RStudio Package Manager. And then the money that we make from these professional products funds our open source software. Most of the money that we earn actually goes into open source software. What's the relationship between R and RStudio? Well, we don't own R, we don't package it, we don't distribute it. The co R core team has 20 members, and zero of them are from RStudio. Uh, we like to say our studio sits on top of R. Um, so you standardize on R first and then install R products second. We assume that you have chosen to invest in R. In fact, last year I gave a webinar called Professional R Tooling and Integration, where I talked about legitimacy, competencies, and adoption. So legitimacy is about recognizing R as an analytic standard, and competencies are about understanding and managing R tooling, and adoption is about relying on integrated R based solutions. So today we're going to be talking about competencies and where those competencies come from. How do you learn about R? This is a big problem, actually, with a lot of our customers. They don't know how to do uh, to administer our products in their organization. And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, first of all, um, R is relatively unknown in most organizations. There's no single place to get all the information you need. It's really hard to see the forest through the trees. There's a lot of pieces involved. A lot of things are changing very quickly. So we see a lot of our customers going through a lot of trial and error. Um, some of those include organizational hurdles. Uh, for example, the IT department might be completely separate from the data science department, and maybe the communication or the support isn't there. Um, or there might be resource limitations, like maybe there's uh, the, the funding for the headcount is separate from the funding for the, the servers or the infrastructure, and they're not able, and people aren't able to get uh, the uh, servers that they need. So today I want to share some best practices for managing our studio in production. 
want to share the product requirements, go over some tips, and give you a path for getting started. My goal is to give you a big picture view of what success looks like, assuming you're using our products. So I want to share five best practices for administering our studio in production. Number one, keep your system up to date. So you're going to want modern tools for your data science platform. That means modern operating systems and modern browsers. You'll be using the cutting edge tools. You'll be doing cutting edge analysis. You'll be hiring people with very um, important skills. And you're going to want modern tools for all of those things. You'll need a C++ 11 compiler um, so that you can build the R packages on your system. And you'll want to think about your internet access. And that's because all of your packages are coming from the they are probably coming from the internet. If you don't have internet access in your server environment, and a lot of organizations don't, then it's very important that you talk to our studio because all of our products are designed to run in an offline mode. Number two, support multiple versions of R. Why do you want to support multiple versions of R? Well, because you want to be able to manage upgrades. You want to be able to test code on a variety of R versions, and you want to support projects that depend on various versions of all R. All of, our, all of our products support multiple versions of R. We recommend that you upgrade uh, at least yearly and that you use a modern version of R, so 3.1 or greater. And then finally, we, this is very important that we recommend that you build R from source. Uh, building R from source allows you to install multiple versions of R side by side. It's not hard to do. It follows the standard config, make, make, install path. Most organizations have a process for building software from source already in place. And we have instructions for how to do that. Number three, organize your R packages. So R packages rule the nest. Uh, packages will drive your R version, your Linux dependencies, and even your operating system. Data scientists will want to access their most beloved packages. So say you have a data scientist who wants like the most recent you know, modeling package, and they try to install it and it fails, because it needs a new version of R. And so you want to upgrade that version of R, and then you find that you're going to need some Linux binaries, but those Linux binaries aren't really supported by your operating system. So suddenly, you're upgrading your whole operating system to support that package of R. That is not an unrealistic scenario. That's one reason we say keep your platform modern and up to date. So it turns out that modern, that managing packages for a single user is quite easy, like you do on your desktop. But managing packages for an entire platform is really hard. And we should know, our studio knows a lot about managing packages. So we created a package manager. It's called the RStudio Package Manager. And it solves several pro problems. One problem is when your environment is disconnected from the internet or you're in an air-gapped environment, you need a way to get packages into that environment. And Package Manager can help with that. Another one is being able to serve consistent environments to Docker containers. So if your Docker container is running um, one environment, it's probably not the same environment that you're building on, but the package manager can help standardize those environments. Um, you, there's also security control for um, uh, package repositories. A lot of organizations like to cure, curate the packages that, that, that gets delivered to their um, organization. And then also package manager helps with sharing internal packages. So since package manager is brand new, I thought I'd run through a quick demo of how it works. This is the RStudio package manager. And it has this nice UI. So people can log in and see all the packages that are available to them. And in this case, um, these are my packages. This is my description. I can see like how often my packages are being updated here. So in this case, these uh, packages were updated uh, on March 17th. And 179 packages were added. 159 packages were archived. You can see the alpha sim r package here was archived in version 0.9 because it was upgraded to version 0.10. Now, all the packages in this snapshot are indexed with this identifier 1303. If I want to see all of the in all of the snapshots, I can look at this calendar function and see uh, the history of when my packages were updated. So my most recent version was March 17th. And here I can see this is the specific snapshot, 1303, that uh, indexes that specific set of packages. I can copy that URL 
and I can paste it into my IDE. And that means that everything that, all the packages I pull from then on in that IDE are going to pull from the, a very specific set of packages. Then I can take that, uh, that uh, URL, the package repository location, and put that in my Docker container when I spin up the container, and it will pull the same packages I use from my analysis. We call this a shared baseline, so that everyone is going to be using the same packages that are uh, pegged to this checkpoint. In addition to uh, these in the indexing the packages, I can also organize multiple repositories. So here you see I have a repository that consists just of validated uh, packages for my, my group. This repository has packages that were contributed internally but from my organization. And this repository has packages that are being pulled down from GitHub. So uh, what this does is what, what like package manager allows me to do is pull down packages from GitHub and compile them uh, or build them locally so that I can have the most up-to-date packages. I can also see the usage stats um, for my packages, which is nice. I can see which packages are being downloaded and which licenses are being used. So package manager is really valuable to organizations who are standardizing on R. We hope you'll give that a, a consideration. Um, we'll be coming back and visiting that in a little bit. All right, so number, number four, use uh, root privileges. So the group in your organization that installs, configures, and manages R in RStudio will need root privileges. So RStudio installs, all, RStudio installs require root privileges, and RStudio products also um, run as root. RStudio Server Pro runs as the root user in order to create a new R session on behalf of its users and RStudio Connect runs as a root user in order to isolate applications and processes. I will also add that um, system-wide installations of R on Linux oftentimes uh, involve root as well. So this is very important that the people that have the permissions in your system to install R are able to, um, under, are able to do so effectively. So that means if that person is you, then you need to know how to install the products and the software um, sufficiently on that system. And if that person is someone else, then you need to help that person understand what this process involves. That means installing R, the R packages, and the products. So the root user privileges, you may or may not have that, but whoever does have that needs to have that understanding of what it means to support a platform on R. Okay, and the last one, uh, five, is securely manage your users. There's two types of users. There's R programmers and there's end users. And the R programmers uh, will need access to R file shares, databases, and probably many other sensitive systems. R, pro R processes for the R programmers run as the user under a local account. So um, users need local accounts on the system to be run making running these types of analyses. End users, on the other hand, um, are people that may or may not know R and just consume apps and reports. For these, the R processes typically run under a service account. And if you look at our two products, you'll see that RStudio Server Pro is serving uh, R programmers and RStudio Connect is serving end users. The way you configure uh, RStudio or R programmers and end users are probably going to be slightly different experiences. Um, and those hooking up those systems will be slightly different as well. So how do you hook those up? Well, that's where authentication comes in. Your organization probably has strong opinions on how to authenticate users. Uh, this space is only getting more fragmented, not less. So if you look at like a lot of on-prem solutions today, we'll have like LDAP, Active Directory, um, and then a lot of the web um, technologies, uh, the, the cloud technologies have things like Okta, Duo, and Auth, and Ping, and Shibboleth, and, and many, many more. So we want to support as many systems as possible to work with your authentication system, and we're working hard to do that. Um, and then you will go ahead and configure our studio with those whatever authentication system that your organization have has. Now, if our uh, products don't support your particular authentication system, then we recommend using proxied auth. In proxied auth, uh, users don't log in through our studio; they actually log through a proxy that you set up. And all of this is in, in the guides. 
the supported auth methods for RStudio Server Pro or PAM, pretty much, um, and RStudio Connect, the supported auth methods are typically uh, LDAP, Active Directory, or PAM, and, uh, and, and SAML, which is coming up uh, soon. So we're working on, on SAML. Uh, finally, I want to mention Kerberos, which is an authentication. It's access control, but you use Kerberos to connect to databases, and those are supported by our, our drivers. Uh, our professional drivers allow you to connect to databases using ODBC. All right, so in summary, uh, here's my recommendations. Uh, number one, keep your operating systems and browsers up to date. Number two, plan to support multiple versions of R by building R from source. Number three, organize your R packages for reliability and consistency. Number four, use root privileges to install and run RStudio products. And number five, securely manage your R programmers and end users. So if you stay to these five things as you architect and execute your R platform, you will have uh, a lot more success. And there's some information. Uh, so we've written up some information about how to do this online as well. If you come to this page, you can see we've got professional product requirements. And I go through all the professional product requirements here. All right, so now that we have like a path for success, what does it look like to get started? So the first thing is to get the right tools. Um, our studio makes um, tools that you put together. There are many ways to assemble our tools, but it's going to be up to you to decide how to put them together. Your configuration depends on what data science means to your organization. Our goal is to make it as easy to install and configure all of our products. So your solutions might look like a data science lab where all your data scientists you know, work together. Maybe you, you're building uh, applications in a dev test prod framework that you're trying to orchestrate and deliver to end users. You could be on premises or on a cloud or a hybrid cloud. You could have a single server or multi-departmental deployments, depending on how large your organization is. No matter what you're doing, I typically recommend thinking about a crawl, walk, run strategy, where you think about like what the platform is going to look like long term, and then you start with crawl and walk. Uh, I see a lot of organizations doing that, and I think that's a fine strategy. So this is what a setup might look like for you. Uh, you might have, uh, you know, R Studio might develop uh, before your development uh, platform, and will connect to your projects and your home file shares. Your R Studio Connect will be your your publishing platform, and will connect to your uh, your your file share and your metadata. And then your package manager will support both of these products. And then down below here, we have some databases or data sources that you're going to hook up with our professional drivers. Now, the way you, the number of servers that you use and the size of the servers you use can is you know wild you know varies across the board. You can put all three products onto the same server. I would call that a sandbox, and that's fine. We do that internally. You could put a different product onto uh, each server, and this is typically what we recommend: is you know separate the products onto their own servers. And, we call that a, a data science lab. You have three servers that are working together. You can double that for high availability if you'd like to make sure that you're going to have you know, a server to fail over to if there's a problem. And then if you want to extend those out you know, in a clustered approach, you can do that as well. We have some guidelines for hardware configuration and sizing. And you can look at that um, and kind of get started with the, the size of your servers. All right, so once you have your hardware set up, let's talk about uh, recipes for doing the installation and configuration. Recipes are a list of ingredients that make up your platform. They help you organize and automate your work, and uh, they're probably going to be unique to your organization. Now, most recipes um, will have a, a structure that will look like code for Linux, R, and R packages. Then there will have be a small section for your installation, and then the rest of it will be about your configuration. So if you've installed R properly, installation will be pretty easy to do. Um, com uh, the configuration can be uh, simple or complex. So I went back and pulled out some of my old recipes, um, and I wanted to show you one here. This is actually the recipe that was I used to build the box that this script is actually run running on. Um, and you can see that most of it is around Linux and just getting set up, getting the dependencies. And then I come down here to this section where I show uh, 
multiple versions of R being built from source. Then here's my packages, all the packages I installed in my system library. And then this little section is uh, the install. And that's really typical. If you if you installed R properly, hopefully our installs go really easily. Um, and then this last section is the configuration. And like I said, your configuration may be complex or simple. This is a pretty simple configuration. I just set a few things around the groups and the, the dashboard and memory limits. And, um, and then that's it. So this is a really simple uh, recipe, uh, something that you can run by hand. Uh, what you really want to do with these recipes is go ahead and um, you know automate them. So my colleague Kelly O'Brien gave a great talk at R Studio Conf called uh, Configuration Management and Tools for the R Admin, where she argued for infrastructure as code uh, using things like Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Code Deploy, Salt Stack, and or systems like these. And what these do is they organize your recipes so that you can manage your platform more effectively and automatically. Um, so I, I definitely encourage you to have those conversations with your, your team on how to uh, set that up. You need to be very good at deploying R and managing upgrades and um, you know, helping these platforms uh, scale out. And to do that, you might wanna buy or uh, you know, procure a sandbox that allows you to play around with the configuration scripts. So the sandboxes are, are great places to learn. And uh, if you haven't done this before, it just uh, typically involves reading a lot of docs and trying things out. It's tax season um, and uh, you know, playing with uh, system administration reminds me a little bit of taxes. You just have to read a lot of really boring and detailed documents and, and try things out. Um, hopefully um, when you make a mistake in your uh, sandbox, uh, that will be a lot less forgiving than the IRS will be if you make a mistake in your taxes. But the general idea is uh, open up the docs, get familiar with the, with the work, and, um, and try things out. All right, so what if you've never used any of these products? Well, that's where the RStudio Quick Start comes in. So the RStudio Quick Start is a virtual machine that runs on your desktop. It includes all of our professional products and includes pre-built assets for you to explore and demonstrate to others. So the reason we did this was so that people could experience our studio professional products freely and easily. Um, and I want to go ahead and demo the quick start to you today. This is the quick start page. This is the location. Um, it's fairly easy to find. You enter uh, your, your name and email and the download will take about 20 minutes to download. It's a fairly large payload if your internet connection is faster, maybe 10 minutes. And then you'll need to also download and install VirtualBox. And VirtualBox uh, allows you to run this VM on your Windows or your Mac desktops. And there's instructions for both. So just uh, pull up the appliance and hit the, hit the go button and you will be good to go. So let me, uh, once, once that's ready to go, you'll point your browser to localhost 5000 and it will look something like this. Well, it won't look like that at all. It'll look like this. There you go. So this is our welcome page and we can take a tour and you can find out all about RStudio Connect and play around with that and a little bit about RStudio Server Pro as well. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll just log into RStudio Connect. This is the main U UI for RStudio Connect. And you can see there's some assets here that I've already put in to the, the tool. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you a couple of those. This is the enterprise ready dashboards. The great thing about this uh, dashboard is that it runs on Shiny on our studio connect and it connects to a database that we actually installed inside of the virtual machine. And these, um, this is done with D3. I can click this and it will uh, zoom in. Uh, if I drill down, it'll open up a new tab. If I drill down again, it'll open up another new tab. And I can decide who this dashboard is, can, uh, who gets to see this dashboard. So for example, right now anyone can see it, but if I just want to specify uh, limit it to specific users, I could do that as well. I can also decide how many resources to give the dashboard. Now this is in a VM, so this, the limit 
the resources are going to be limited. But if this were on a server, I could increase the number of connections and serve more users. So this is a Shiny application. And uh, Shiny applications are really uh, great for interactive analyses. Sometimes you need to run things in batch mode and send snapshots of the, the work that you're doing. And for the, that type of work, you want to use an R Markdown document. So here is another dashboard, but it's written in R Markdown. So it might look like a, it might look like a Shiny application, but it's actually not. It's actually a static dashboard, it just has a lot of interactive graphics inside of it. And what's cool about this one is that I can actually make changes to this dashboard through parameters that I've added to my document. So R Markdown can be parameterized. So here, if I select you know, a, a new, new settings and I do a new window, run up the, the acceptance rate, I can run this report and this will update that report with those settings. When I'm done with that, I can, I can go ahead and, and send out the email, right? So I'll go ahead and run this report. While it's running, I'll come over here and look at the email. This email is also inside of the virtual machine. And you can see it has a star because I just sent it today, um, just now. And this is what the email looks like. So it's got some graphics in it. It's got some information. It tells me, like, I mean, if you have any questions. And I've attached my Excel document here, which allows me to pull up Excel and look at the data. These are the data in this report. So this is a great way to share your information. And if you want to um, distribute your information, you can do that as well on a schedule. I'll hit the schedule. I can go ahead and set the schedule and say, I want to run this report every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Go ahead and save that. And I can send myself an email when I'm done. I can send it to collaborators. I can decide who else I want to send it to. And that means I can send one report to one group and another version of this report to another group on a schedule. I don't have to worry about it. And if I do need, if I do have any issues, those are all going to be tracked in the logs here, and I can see the logs. Go back to my code. I can fix the law, the code, and publish that information here. So how how do I publish information back in here? Well, let's let's take a quick look. I'll come back to the welcome page. And notice I have a lot of other products in here. Um, I've got RStudio Server Pro in here as well. So I'll go ahead and click that. And this will deliver an instance of RStudio Pro to me. And I have a simple Shiny application here. I can run this application in my IDE. And you can see that I can play around with this. And I can publish this to RStudio Connect. Oh, it doesn't like it. Let me go ahead and create a new one. File, new file, shiny web app, new app. Can run that. I'll publish this to RStudio Connect. And while it's publishing, what it does is it goes back and it kind of describes all the environment um, and then sends that information over to RStudio Connect so it can rebuild the environment along with all the code and data assets. And there we have it in RStudio Connect. And I, again, I can decide who I want to share this with. I can even open this in its own window and then that URL will you know, work with anyone that's on my machine, which is me. I'm the only one on my machine. Um, but uh, this is how you would share a Shiny application on a server. Okay. Now, in addition to the Shiny applications and the R Markdown documents that you can publish, you can also publish uh, APIs. And APIs are uh, basically systems for allowing you know, one computer to talk to another computer. And in this case, this is a plumber API, and that means that um, it's which uses a rest and that means i can call my api through a, a rest call a rest based call like through a browser so i will show you what this looks like if i go ahead and try out this api and i say give me the stock ticker for facebook right 
it gives me all the information for Facebook and it gives me this URL that I can use to query the API. So there's Facebook, if I do Microsoft, create the API and pull up Microsoft. Now, APIs are extremely helpful for the handoff problem. If you need to hand off your R analyses to someone else, then um, APIs are a great way to do that because all you have to specify to the, the, the other group or the other system is the API itself. You don't have to say anything about R. So you can keep R running on R Studio Connect and use that to serve information to other systems. It's really nice. They're easy to code. They're easy to deploy. OK. Um, great. So let's come back to the, our presentation here. So in summary, oh, wait, wait, hold on. I think I went too fast. I wanted to show a few more things on the um, RStudio Quick Start. So in addition to RStudio Server Pro, RStudio Connect, we also have the Package Manager, which I, I've showed, um, which I've shown you already. And you can see how this has a curated uh, package list. You can also uh, come in here and take a look at the resource guide, which will give you an overview of uh, getting started and um, learning about our products. There's this great article here under tips for planning your evaluation that talks about how to explore the value of the products, proving the process works, and testing the configuration. So these are all great for getting started. If you have any questions or need any help, you can get that here at the RStudio community forums under the help section. So that's going to be this group, right? Um, and our team is all over this. Uh, the person that put most of this together was Cole Art. Um, this is Cole here, and uh, he would love to hear from you. I would definitely love to make the products better. So if you end up using Quick Start and you find that you have an issue, please reach out to him. Some of our most common issues are collected in this frequently asked questions section on our site. <clears throat> most of the problems so far have been around VirtualBox more than around the Quick Start. So this will be useful. And then um, if you want to get uh, more technical information, you can come here to the official documentation. So we hope that you'll use the um, the quick start, try it out, um, get a feel for it. It actually comes in handy for many things that I do personally. So I find that I get a lot of benefit out of this. Um, we hope that you'll uh, get a chance to try it out and, and experience some of our products. Um, and uh, we hope that it's an easy and a, a good experience for you. All right, so in summary, we've talked about uh, the happy path, about keeping your operating system and uh, browser up to date supporting multiple versions of R by building R from source, making sure that you have easy access to R packages, installing products as root, and uh, using a supported operating system. Um, we also talked about uh, recipes and checklists, the crawl, walk, run strategy, and using a sandbox, as well as um, RStudio Connect, or uh, RStudio Quick Start. Um, again, reach out to us. Please, please talk to Solutions Engineering. We'd love to hear from you. And then at the end here, we have a number of references for you to like go get some more information uh, about this. I know this was very reference heavy, but I hope that it was uh, useful to you. Uh, we'll be publishing some more material like this to help your teams scale out their um, their products, uh, not just our Studio Server Pro or our Studio Connect alone, but all of the products um, together. I, I think we'll be providing more um, resources around that approach. And again, if um, you do have any issues, please look us up on community and uh, share your feedback with us. We'd love to hear from you. What is the best way to dig into the R files that have been hosted on the R Studio Quick Start Connect? Um, yeah, so th there are a number of files on the Quick Start. So that's actually an interesting question. The easiest way for you to get the R files is to come into this view and click on source versions and click this and then download the bundle. This bundle will contain uh, 
a description of the environment as well as all the code that's required to make this run. All right. Um, you showed how to deploy API and Shiny apps based on R. How does it work when several customers call the service at the same time? You had pods, you managed to have them call in. I want to make sure I understand the question. When you're deploying, so when you deploy a Shiny app or an API, our Studio Server Pro is going to um, bund create a bundle and ship that over to our Studio Connect. So our Studio Connect can handle multiple bundles simultaneously, right? So it can handle all these bundles coming into it. And then when it rebuilds that application, it's going to build, um, it's going to create a container inside of RStudio Connect to run that application. So every bundle is going to get a different um, container. And that's what you can kind of see here with uh, well, the source versions. Let me pull up the other one. Where's the documents? If I come here, you can see like, you can see different versions of this bundle being pulled up, right? So this is one version, this is another version. And if you have you know, multiple assets, then we'll, we'll have multiple histories. Can this setup be done in AWS as well? I'm not sure what that means by this setup, but all of our tools can be done, it can be built on-prem or in the cloud. And this exact setup that you're looking at at Quick Start um, would be done in AWS. How does storage work between local and Kubernetes? Um, so you have to, so, so we're gonna do another webinar about uh, deployments um, and how to, how deployments work at our studio and you know what the best strategies are for doing deployments. Uh, right now, that your uh, deployments are being handled kind of on the back end, you know, for you. Um, you know, you're not seeing a lot of that work. Like when you push a button and you deploy an application, or when you start up a container and uh, it just automatically runs for you. You're not seeing the deployment process. But what's happening there is the same thing every time you're, you you create a, an environment. You describe the environment that you're developing in, you bundle up the code and you ship it over and then you reconstitute that environment in the new location. That's just how deployments work. So those three processes are gonna carry over um, every time you're, you're creating a container. So the question is, how does data storage work? Well, you can bundle, you can like try to ship over, you know, that, that information, you know, through environment variables or something like that, or you can, um, you know, reattach that information through um, shared file storages, so it's shared file storage. All right, can RStudio Server Pro run um, Docker R instances? So RStudio Server Pro um, today does not run Docker R instances. That's the short answer. In the future, we'll have um, the ability to launch jobs um, uh, using uh, different um, container systems. Let's see, and that's, again, that, that's, I, I would encourage you to go back to the blog that was blog post that was written um, last week um, that will give you more information about how that works. Does the Plumber API need end users to have R? Um, yeah, so no, no. So the end users on a Plumber API are just making a web call, just like um, you're calling out to a web page. That's the beauty of the API is that the R process is actually hosted on the RStudio Connect. So say you have a scoring equation that you want to run against uh, like a database, your database could actually be configured to call out to our Studio Connect, um, send the information that needs to score that model, and R would run on the uh, Connect and like deliver the score based on whatever complex analytic model that you've created in R, and then send it back to that system without that system ever having to use R. That's, that's the beauty of the APIs. What's the best practice to deploy our Studio Connect from dev to prod environment? Yeah, that's another really, really good question, and I didn't get a chance to address it here, but um, there are ways um, to set up, um, I mean, well, first of all, I will say, generally, that your dev environment is your RStudio IDE, and so um, you're wondering, like, how do you deploy it to a production system? Um, there's the push button model that I showed you, but there's also these programmatic um, deployment functions that allow you to, um, share your or publish your work um, without on systems that don't have any information about um, R. And that's useful for like publishing from like GitHub, for example, or from some other, you know, 
automated system that your organization uses. Um, those are all really good. And there's information about that on uh, solutions. So if I come back here to solutions and you look at deployments, you can find out more information about deployments here. Uh, where, where Linux systems have shared home directories for users, what are the best practices for running multiple RStudio Pro servers? So uh, um, that's, that's exactly right. You're, you're, going to want, um, you're going to want to mount your shared NFS across all of your servers. And there's two locations. I shared it briefly, um, but I'll go into more depth. Uh, one is for your project files. You'll want to share all of your, you'll want to put all your project files on the NFS um, server. And the other one is for your home directory, which has some configuration knobs inside of it for RStudio Server Pro. Both of those should be mounted across all of your, your servers. You can think of your RStudio servers as um, compute engines mostly, right? They, they ingest information into RAM and they operate on it and they spit things back. They, they don't contain data long term. And that goes with Connect as well. Connect's more of a compute engine. All of your content uh, should be on a shared file system. All of your metadata should be stored somewhere else. Um, so it's not on those, those compute nodes. I hope that made sense. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Are you able to install an older, older version of packages? When oh, package manager, uh, I think that's package manager question, and yes, you can uh, organize those packages any way that you would like. Can you explain air-gapped environments for package manager? So Emilio, I, I take it that you, you haven't had to deal with that because if you did, um, that would be a, a painful question. Um, air gap environments are, are set up for security purposes and those servers don't have any connection to the internet at all. So um, the only way you can get information into those is through another process, like some sort of file copy process that the admins control. So an air gapped environment means that if you want to get the latest information, you can't download it. You have to go talk to somebody else to have it transferred over into your setup. You ever had a old, uh, you know, Macintosh circa 1985? That would be an air gapped environment. Okay. Um, could you comment on why building R from source is better than say installing it from Debian or a bunch of packages? Yeah. Uh, so building R from source is better because it builds against your um, your own system. So you're going to be confident that it will run with your system. So when you compile it, it's using the libraries on, on your system. Um, it also, you know, like I said, allows you to build, put um, R you know, side by side with other installations of R. So it becomes extremely useful. But I think best practices in general involve compiling that, that software on your system. Uh, what we tend to use uh, the repository, what you could, what we tend to use the repositories for is like identifying the dependencies. So when you build R, you have to go out and find all the things that are needed to build R. Um, and that can be useful. Uh, the repositories can be very, very useful for that. But actually getting the binaries from the repositories, I, I try to steer clear from that. All right, so any other things here? System-wide libraries versus user installed. Yeah, that's that information. So Matt, that information is coming. Um, like, there's a lot of work that we're doing right now when it comes to uh, library and package uh, library management, uh, making things reproducible. So your question is a really good one. You know, how do you handle libraries? Um, you know, system-wide libraries versus user installed libraries. Traditionally, um, the system admin has control of your system library and then your users have control of your user libraries. Um, and that's kind of what we, that tends to be what we recommend today. Um, that's kind of the state, you know, the, the de facto standard. I think in the future we'll have better organization around uh, libraries uh, and how they interact with projects so that uh, things become more reproducible. 